But for now, I'll jump into the summer part, or the spring, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, after the winter is the spring, obviously, from April 1st to May 14th. Now, the May 14th is a, is a set date because that's just a, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife guideline, but April 1st is kind of kind of where we say the spring, and that's when spring studies can start. Um, the females, they, when they're fully awake and they're full, you know, they will wake up when they're hibernating. They'll go get a drink of water, but then shut down. And, you know, a lot of times there's water in the, in the caves. I've seen, you know, just a, a natural spring in a cave, and there's, you know, three or four bats that come in and take a drink, and then they go back to, back to sleep for a couple months. Um, but once they're fully awake and fully aroused for, you know, for moving out of the caves and getting ready for the summer, that's when uh, they, the, they basically store the sperm all winter long, and then they, in, the, in the spring they release that sperm, and that's when fertilization happens. And then so then now they're pregnant. Um, the females start heading out towards what we call maternity sites and maternity colonies, and it's kind of a migration. And like it says there, they can go from about eight miles away from the hibernating site to 350 miles away. So these, you know, these aren't deer or bears where they're just going to walk and, and you know, cover a couple of miles in a day. These, you know, they're flying animals, and they can just jump over trees, and then they're on a migration route for you know, upwards of 350 miles. They won't make it all in one trek. They'll stop over, you know, eat, you know, rest, and build up their stores, but they'll, they'll eventually get there. And then once they do, once they start their uh, summer, s summer season between May 15th and August 15th, uh, the females form these uh, what we call maternity colonies, and for northern long-eared bats, that's about 30 to 60 female bats in a tree. And so what I what I mean and why they form these maternity colonies is so basically, all of the female bats that are pregnant and about to give birth, they all roost together in one tree. And I'll show you a picture of a tree later. But basically, why they do this is they're trying to conserve energy so that they don't have to waste energy on trying to stay warm, and they're going to focus all their energy on on their developing uh, baby, or once they've had the baby on developing the, the milk for them to grow. And so they can concentrate all their energy on, on the baby, basically, and leave energy expenditure to the ambient temperature, basically. So, so all species of bats do not, not all species, but these are the hibernating bats do this. Like the red bats and the hoary bats and silver-haired, they, they still, they're, they're solitary. They migrate. Uh, basically solitary, and they live in the summer. They have they have their pups, and then they just they stay by themselves, and they don't go into trees. They they stay out. And it's really crazy because I've tracked red bats, and they stay out in in the leaves. They just stay out in the open. They just when they're all curled up, they look like a dead leaf. And I've been right underneath one, like five feet away. I'm like, I know, I know you're here. Where are you? And it you know it took me an hour to find it, but I found it. Um, and the hoary bats will do the same thing. They just look like a, a dead leaf or a dead pine cone, and um, yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, the gentleman asked if this was all bat species or just uh, the hibernating bats, and that was my answer that I said before. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, I mean, uh, it depends on the bat. You know, Indiana bats they look for exfoliating bark or or bark that's like kind of a snag, and then the bark's kind of peeling away, and then they'll go and and typically go underneath that bark. Um, but, you know, they can do shag bark, they can do oak or maple, or just whatever's really dead and kind of peeling away bark. Whereas northern long-eared bats, you know, they can, they can really roost in any tree. It's what they're looking for more is it, they'll look for that exfoliating bark. I'm sorry, I forgot to repeat the question again. He asked, uh, do, they look, do bats look for a specific tree? And I'm in the midst of answering it. Um, and so the northern long-eared bats will look for a crack or a crevice or, or just a hole you know, dug out by woodpeckers or something like that. And then uh, they'll roost in there. Uh, northern long-eared bats, that's the number of you know, an average size for a maternity colony is 30 to 60 bats. Little browns and Indianas can get into the hundreds. So when we do these surveys and we're trying to find one bat, when we find a maternity roost, we can potentially find 60 bats. I got, I just on on a different project in in Wisconsin that I have, um, we just found a bat with that led us to a tree that had 53 bats in it. They sat down and counted it, and there was 53 bats. And then on the second night, there was 49. So um, that was that's a that's a really good tree for for northern long-eared bats. Um, yeah. When they fly, 
the 350 miles do they fly during the day and night? I uh, know they'll, they'll stick just to the night. They, they can fly during the day. It's not, you know, they aren't vampires and they're not going to die when they're out, but they're, they're much more, uh, they're better equipped to fly at night. They don't have to compete with birds because, you know, like swallows and stuff, I always just call them bats during the day because they eat the same thing and they kind of fly the same way and they just kind of live a similar life, but during the day. Whereas bats, there's no birds flying around, a lot of birds flying around uh, eating insects at night. And so they've kind of got that role, role filled and... Um, Basically, with the echolocation, uh, what it's been found is that they can see everything that we can see except for color, because you can't get color with sound. But with an, a, a echolocation imagery, they could they could basically plot out this entire room, your facial features, and you know the lights and everything, because they're they're flying around out there in in the midst of trees. And if you're in a thick young forest stand like these northern long-eared bats uh, typically go into, they they have to weave in and out, and not just trees, but branches and leaves and stuff. And they 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 don't want to crash. Basically, if, if bats fall or crash into something, they're going to fall, and there's a good chance that they're going to die because, I, like I said, they're not very uh, very good on their feet once they hit the ground. And there's a lot of times predators waiting for them on the ground: skunks, uh, raccoons, and foxes, and snakes, and owls, and everything will try to eat them. Um, and you know, another common misconception, I'll just jump, jump into this right now since I'm talking about it, is that bats fly into your hair or are attracted to hairspray. I don't know if you guys have heard that one, but I was in a cave, uh, I was in uh, Mammoth Cave in Kentucky and I was just having fun doing a cave tour with some of my other bat biologist friends and you know, the big tour and there was a lot of people like, now I see a bat up there, is, are they gonna fly? I've got a lot of hairspray into my hair and we're just like, ah, oh, why, why would, I don't know why that even is a thing, but people think that. Um, but it's not true. Bats do not want to crash into you. They, this is their livelihood. Flying is what they've got, and they're very, very, very good at it. I've been in a cave where literally there's six inches of space on either side of my head, and bats just boom, 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 just flying around. And at first, you know, it takes a minute to, to get used to bats flying at your head, but once you're, once you're in there and realizing that they're, they're better at their job than I am, then they're not going to hit me. And so I walk in and I found, you know, the group of a thousand that were up there and then just the small group flying around my head. So they're very good at what they do. They do not want to crash. They do not want to, they don't want to fall because once they do, it's, that's pretty much death for them. Uh, they can get up and fly away. That's not, it's not the end of the road, but there's a lot of predators that are ready for them if they do. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, even uh, bats can see as well as, as we do. Uh, with their eyes, yeah, they're not blind either. They, they can see very well. Because they're flying at night. Yeah, and they've got really small eyes, but they really can see as well as we can. But what I was uh, talking about was the echolocation. So when they're using uh, the echolocation, and I'll get into kind of our, our equipment that we use to detect that stuff, um, they can see with their sound all that we can see except for color. So, but they're not colorblind during the day. If they were to fly during the day, they could see just as well as we could. But they're better at echolocating than seeing. So we don't, we don't have the best vision. Uh, if you put me as a pilot in, in a small forest, I'm going to crash into everything. But, and it's probably the same with bats if they were flying during the day. But using the echolocation, they can, they can get a lot better uh, perception and, and depth of everything, including bugs that they're trying to go after. Oh, yeah, yeah, almost, prim almost primarily. During the day, they might use... They might use vision. I mean, they've got their eyes open and everything, but it's so hard to see at night. And even if you're used to it, if they've, you know, they're not cats out there where they any any light at all and they can see everything. They're they're using sound primarily. Um, yeah, and it's and it's really cool because you can see when when we catch a bat, you can never hear them flying around. But once you get a, get a bat, they kind of roar at you and scream and everything. And we've got this equipment. I'll bring it out in just a second. Um, that can detect them when they're just foraging around because you can't hear that. You can only hear when they're mad and screaming at you. But even when you, if you've got one of these next to you and they're screaming at you, you hear a whole bunch of other conversations that they're having with you, either calling other people or other bats to, you know, reinforcements or, you know, come help me or stay away from this area. Um, but let me let me get back to the the summer stuff. This is this is really the important stuff and why why we're out here this summer. Um, but so basically, yeah, we're, we're out there and we, we've set up these mist nets and I'll, I'll let you guys see that and I'll go into more detail on what, on what we do with those. But we're looking for, for one bat and then if we can find that one bat, we can find the roost tree that can have 60 to hundreds of bats and, and then we can you know, help 
land agents and land managers and state and federal stuff make guidelines on, on how that project would impact that, that, uh, that roost tree. So, you know, a lot of different projects that we work on, wind, pipeline, uh, just census kind of stuff, and we just kind of give our recommendation on where these trees are and then kind of the fish and wildlife and state kind of take over. Yeah, yeah, you can. Some of the. No, well, a lot of times they will. Oh, so she does hear bats, and what are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so some of the bigger bats, like the big brown bat, you can audibly hear them. There's probably a whole slew of clicks. Basically, it's all kind of clicks that they're doing and screeches and stuff. Um, there's, you can probably hear a little bit of it, but there's probably a whole slew of clicks that you're not hearing. And so what they're doing, big browns especially, they're kind of more out in the open because they're a little bit bigger, and they'll be a little bit more, I've actually seen them be territorial. And so if they're flying along the edge, and then all of a sudden another smaller bat or another bat is kind of in their area, they'll, they'll fly up to it, scream at it, and kind of get it out of their area, and then keep going along their route because they're kind of creatures of habit. You know, they kind of fly along their routes and, and hit areas that they go to, and then uh, they'll leave for a couple of days and then come back and let the bugs kind of repopulate, really. Um, but yeah, so what, what they're doing with, with the clicks, I mean, they're constantly clicking because they're getting a, a visual image of everything around them or, a, or a, a sound image of everything around them. And so um, on, on these things, what we detect is we hear them just flying through, which is just kind of, they, they have slower clicks. They're just, you know, like that. And it'll be just kind of a, a visual thing of like where they're at, what's around them. But then when they get near, uh, once they detect like a moth or a beetle or something, then those clicks get really fast because they're trying to hone in exactly where that where that beetle is. And so then we call that a feeding buzz on here, and it's it goes and it gets really really loud. And then uh, yeah, then they've caught their anim they've caught their bug. So um, any other questions before I dive right back in? All right. Um, so they give birth. And raise the pups. So about so they're they're kind of starting these uh, colonies around May 15th. Uh, around late June, early July is when they start having having babies. And this is this is kind of typical for all for all the bats in Minnesota. You know, it obviously gives or takes. You know, a couple weeks or something. I mean, we've we've caught bats that are still pregnant here in in mid July, and we're like, wow, well, you need to go have your baby. You know, let's get you out of here and go have your baby. But we've also uh, had some that are lactating really early on as soon as we got here in, in early June and they were already lactating. So it's very variable on how much they're foraging, what their diet's like, and, and the climate of the area where they're, where they're roosting and raising their young. Um, so after that, the pups will, will stay in the roost um, and they will also latch onto mom's back and fly with her. Um, I have caught, in a, caught a bat with a baby on its back, so they'll take them out foraging, but they don't really do that that often. Most of the time, what, if you catch a bat like that, it's that they're moving them to a different tree. Um, and so basically the pups will stay in the tree until they're moved to another one. And they do have, they do have some roost fidelity where they'll stay, uh, they'll go back to the same tree year after year. I, for example, when I was doing my master's, I came across a tree that my major professor had found 10 years ago and the bats were still going to it. And I was walking around, I was about to put a tree tag in it and then I was like, there's, a, there's one out here. And I got him on the phone and he's like, oh yeah, I remember that tree. And it was pretty crazy because they've been using that tree for 10 years, raising their young in the same tree. Um, but it, during the course of that summer, they'll, they'll also switch to some alternate roosts. And this, you know, there's a lot of, variables that come into why they switch. It's, you know, how their diet was, how the foraging was that night. Do they need a warmer climate? Do they, was it kind of cold and rainy? So we don't know everything that goes into it, but there's some different characteristics of why they switch and, and they will switch and then they'll, and what, what we call alternate roosts. And then that'll be a roost of like three to 10 bats. And then it, it'll just be kind of, maybe they need some alone time or something and not the whole group of 60 to 100 other females uh, with their babies, so. Uh, but then after about after the pups are born, within three to five weeks they're flying, and so we haven't I haven't really seen any yet. Have you seen any juveniles yet? Yeah, we can we can tell juveniles uh, based on uh, their bone uh, fusion, and so what we do is when we catch them, we we shine a light through their through their wings, and and the development of their uh, epiphyseal cartilage 
is how we tell if they're, if they're a juvenile of that year or an adult. And basically, that's all we can tell. We can't tell years from past adult. We just say you know, anything past second year is an adult. Um, but yeah, so after three to five weeks, they're flying, and then they're foraging. They're out there in the, in the wild, eating and eating insects and everything. And so shortly after that, they start uh, becoming more independent, and then they'll kind of start just leaving the maternity colony altogether. And then around the end of the season, around August 15th or about August, the beginning of August, those maternity colonies start to disperse. And then they start the cycle over again and start heading towards their uh, fall swarming and mating and hibernating and do it again and again for, for years on end. Um, just a couple of notes about the habitat during the summer. What we're looking for, and, and we use this for when we're trapping and also you know, just from, from our info when we find roosts. They're looking, and, and this is going to be focused on these uh, myotis bats, like little brown and northern long-eared bat. Uh, but they're, they're looking for riparian kind of mature forests. Excuse me, not mature like huge, huge trees, but you know, size of trees out there about 30 dBh, um, and they'll they like riparian areas because that obviously has a lot more insects, and they use the the kind of the river systems and the creeks and streams as corridors. Um, a lot of times when we set up our nets, and I'll show you in a picture here shortly, we set them up over. We really love creeks and streams with wide open, you know, no snags covering it, but then kind of creates a tunnel effect where uh, the top of the forest kind of is on it, and then we can put up a net, basically, that just encloses the whole thing because that's a, that's a high activity area and where we, we're going to catch some of these forest bats. Um, but we'll also you know, set up uh, nets just on the edge of a forest, and we'll get bats that are just flying up along the edge and using that kind of as a, as a corridor themselves. So, Yes, ma'am. Are, are we looking at streams and rivers or, or ephemeral ponds or any wetlands, really? Um, up here, it's kind of a lot different than where we're used to netting because with the proposed listing of the northern long-eared bat, we're, this is my first time ever netting in Minnesota and for most of, and actually all of my crew. And this is one of the biggest surveys done in Minnesota that we're doing. Um, and so it's a lot different out here with, with how much water you guys have. You have a lot, a lot of water. And so... Out west, when we, when we net out west, we look for any water at all, and we net very different than how we net in the east. Um, and so any, any, even like a cattle stock pond, we just cover it in nets, and then we'll, we'll hammer out like 200 bats because that's just a, a central location where they're all going to go. But out here, we're looking for more, for more like not water that they're going to come drink at, but more as they're going to use it as a foraging corridor. Um, so if it's a stream or, or an open area in a forest, then we will use it. But if there's like trails or ATV trails or roads, but it also has forest on either side and above, then they'll also use that as a foraging corridor. So I'll describe that in a little bit when we get to the mist netting and how, why we choose those sites and everything and, and how it kind of funnels them in. But so that's basically the life cycle, and they just repeat it year after year, sometimes for 40 years. Um, so here's a, I'm going to talk a little bit about our survey methods um, and kind of what, what we're doing out here this summer, basically. I'm going to jump into fall, winter, and spring because those are less common uh, surveys that we do. Uh, there's not a lot known about them, and it's a lot more work to do uh, these surveys than it is to do our summer ones. So um, I'll just go kind of in the same order. Fall surveys, uh, we, we, the only way we can really do that is to we can either attach a transmitter on the bat and hope that it goes right to its hibernaculum and that we can get that information from there. But that's a lot, of, a lot of hoping, and it can be a lot of man hours and a lot of money later that it doesn't actually go that way um, because they don't necessarily go. Like I said, those dates are very variable. You could trap a, a bat in September and be like, all right, cool, it's going to its hibernaculum, and it's not going to go out there until November. So what we typically do on fall surveys is, is try to find known hibernaculum and set up what we call harp traps um, n near the swarm sites and near the entrances of these caves or mines. And basically it's a huge, I don't have one here because we don't, we don't I, we've got some back at the office, but we don't typically do these surveys. But uh, basically it's a large rectangle that we set right in front and then we kind of set some tarp to close off the other areas and then that funnels the bats in. And uh, basically it has three, three or four 
lines of fishing line that are in alternating order. So there's a row and then a row that kind of is an alternate of that and then another row. So basically they fly out, they see this, and they're really good at flying, like I said. They'll dodge that first row, but then there's that second row. And then if they dodge that, then there's the third row or the fourth. And basically they're, they just get tangled up, they kind of hit it, it, it gives a little bit so it's not injuring them, and then they fall down and then we can basically just sit there and wait for you know, 20 minutes and have a big bucket load of, of bats there and we can just kind of identify species. And that's really what we're trying to do with the fall swarm and fall migration data is just kind of identify the species and where they're going and what hibernate, hibernating site they're using. Uh, the winter hibernaculum is a little bit more involved and I've done this uh, for, for a few years and it's a lot of fun. You get down in the caves and it's, it's a whole different world down there. But um, basically what we do there and it started out, we've, we've always did these kind of every couple of years. Now it's a lot more frequent with white nose. But we would go down there and basically just try and find clusters of bats. And once we did that, we'd, you know, I'd try and ID them. If they're high up, then we'll, you know, get a zoom lens on them and try to ID them just by fur color and, and kind of relative size and everything. But um, we're just trying to get a count and an ID species of the bats present in that hibernaculum. But now with white nose, the the big push has been to diagnose the health of that cave or that mine and see if white nose is present or if there's signs of white nose on any of the bats because a lot of times it'll be, you know, the early season and there'll be some developing and it hasn't hit the whole cave yet, but um, we can, you know, hopefully remove that bat and stymie the, the spread a little bit. But so that's, that's the, the, the push for winter hibernaculum studies, especially with the white nose going on. That's, that's a big reason why, uh, those surveys go on now is it goes on year after year now on known hibernaculum so that we can diagnose right away if those bats are going to be in danger. Uh, and then the spring migration, that's basically similar to the fall. Fall one, we, we again use the harp traps uh, to capture the bats exiting the hibernaculum. And then what we'll do after that is attach transmitters. And I'll again show you that in a second what the transmitters look like. Uh, but then that way we can get an idea of what direction they're heading, how far they're direct, uh, how far they're flying, and we can track them for about a week, and then we can get some information on, you know, how far they're flying from their hibernaculum to their to their summer sites, um, just to gather that and try to preserve that habitat along the way, basically. The summer surveys are a lot more extensive, and it's it's for that reason uh, of the maternity colonies. Basically, we're targeting female female bats and and that's why it's so extensive because in a, hibernate, in a hibernating site, you can just go and there it is right there, but they're, they're not moving. So, you know, conserving their summer habitat has become a, a much more of the push uh, in the last like decade for, for bats because it's so dynamic and it's so changing and uh, there's so much that goes on with them raising young there. Um, for the northern long-eared bat, that's uh, NLEB. That's kind of the, the acronym being used right now. I don't like that because we're, we, use, we use this for Indiana bat. That's Myotis sodalis. Uh, this is a bird terminology, and I'm not a birder. I'm a, I'm a mammal guy, so trying to fight back, but I'm losing that battle. Um, but so basically, their guidelines on how we survey for long-eared bats and in, uh, Indiana bats is spelled out pretty rigorously by, by fish and wildlife and then by specific states if they don't follow uh, fish and wildlife. Uh, like I said, the surveys are between May 15th and August 15th, and those are hard dates. If you're doing surveys before that or after that, they don't consider them valid. So if you were to, if I was to be out here and net on August 16th, and I, hey, I caught six northern long-eared bats and, you know, these other species, like, well, that's great, but you can't make any decisions on your project based on that. So it, uh, it has to be between those dates.